A shocking death tonight in the world of professional wrestling. Canadian Owen Hart, known as the Blue Blazer, was killed performing a pre-match stunt. I think everybody was trying to figure out whether it was part of the act or not. And I think until the end, people still didn't know for sure. We don't have any answers as to how this happened yet. And we will shortly. On May 23, 1999, Canadian wrestler Owen Hart, known by his then stage name, The Blue Blazer, fell to his death off camera during a pay-per-view event as he prepared to make a stunt entrance from the rafters of the Kemper Arena in Kansas City, Missouri. This was a tragic and tragic, just a horrible accident. The next evening, wrestling fans tuned in to an atypically somber episode of Raw is War. Because instead of being greeted by the WWE, then still WWF, its usual pyrotechnics and aggression, the viewers saw almost the entire roster of WWE wrestlers in grief gathered together on the entrance ramp for a 10 bell salute. And the typical bravado of professional wrestling had, for that moment, faded away. Revealing that behind the makeup and flashy suits, the people performing these outrageous stunts on television were still very much human. I, th I think there's probably a special place in heaven for Owen Hart. And uh, I, like all the other guys, will miss him. And, and we loved him. This is the story of Owen Hart, his devastating death, as well as the legacy which he left behind. The Hart Wrestling family, or the Hart Dynasty, had been a name long known in the wrestling world by the time Owen James Hart was born on May 7, 1965. His parents, Stu and Helen Hart, had been the owners and operators of Stampede Wrestling, and Stu had been an amateur as well as professional wrestler for years himself. And he was a prime example of somebody that started out with nothing, survived, made it all the way to the top, I was intimidated of my dad, I respected him. Just that fear of ever doing something wrong kept me from, from doing something wrong. And together, Stu and Helen had 12 children, eight of whom were boys, with Owen being the youngest. She said, it's a funny thing. Every time Stu hangs his pants on the end of the bed, I'm pregnant. The weather is cold in the winter. <laughs> Given their upbringing, it's not a surprise that at least some of the Hart children would find their way into the wrestling world. In fact, all eight of the Hart sons would go on to become wrestlers. But it would be Brett and Owen who would reach considerable stardom in the World Wrestling Federation, now known as World Wrestling Entertainment or the WWE. You know, I think my family kind of had this image of, you know, we're the Hearts, we are, uh, you know, invincible. Owen Hart got his start by racing in high school, and he continued the sport into college at the University of Calgary. However, his wife Martha would later explain in her book titled Broken Hearts that Owen never intended for wrestling to be his career. And I don't know why, I, I should have just said, I don't want this. It took precedent over my, uh, the whole purpose why I was going to university in the first place, you know, to get a degree. But as fate had it, nothing else quite panned out for him and he soon found himself training with his father in the famed Hart Dungeon. He would take you down there and methodically just wrestle with you, put you in submission hold. He always knew what he was doing, but it, you know, uh, am I gonna get out of here alive? You put the chin in the eye. By 1987, Owen Hart was one of the hottest up-and-comers in wrestling and Pro Wrestling Illustrated named him Rookie of the Year. And not long after that, Owen Hart joined Vince McMahon's then WWF as the Blue Blazer, who wore a mask and was sort of a superhero of the wrestling mythos during a time when wrestling very much revolved around heroes and villains. Unfortunately for Owen, the Blue Blazer character was set up to defeat newcomers to the industry with relative ease, but was set up to lose against wrestling's biggest stars. And in 1989, Owen ended up leaving the WWE after a match against Mr. Perfect, who in the eyes of Vince McMahon had more star power. 
it made him look at wrestling in a different light like you know what maybe this isn't all it's cracked up to be that maybe you know it's not worth taking so seriously in 1993 however owen hart would return to the wwe to wrestle alongside his brothers bruce keith and brett in a match at survivor series against Shawn michaels and his knights which ended with Owen confronting Brett, which would kick off a family feud that would become the focal point of his career. I was so, I broke down and cried. I felt so bad. You, you have to go on and say you can't stand Owen and he's spoiled and rotten and no one has to say you are conceited. By November of 1993, Owen Hart's brother, Bret Hart, was the top babyface of the WWE or the top good guy of the WWE, as well as being a former WWE champion, and a narrative was suggested that would see Bret facing off in a sibling rivalry against Owen. And this rivalry would ultimately see Owen transform from a masked superhero to a heel or a bad guy in the WWE. Now we have to go through this charade, 24 hours a day, of two brothers that have this intense rivalry with each other and a lot of hatred and bad feeling. In January of 1994, Brayton Owen teamed up once again, this time for a tag team championship match against the Quebecers. And during the match, Brett sustained an injury to his knee, but refused to tag Owen in. Eventually, with Brett unable to continue and Owen stuck on the sidelines, the referee called the match in favor of the Quebecers, leaving a frustrated Owen kicking Brett's leg out from underneath him and storming out of the ring. He liked being the bad guy, and he did it really well, and he could do the mean faces. After the build-up resulting from the sibling rivalry angle, the brothers would eventually face each other at WrestleMania 10 when they would go toe-to-toe -to -toe in the ring. And the match ended with Owen Hart being victorious over his brother Brett in his greatest career win to date. Owen Hart would eventually team up with Yokozuna to win the Tag Team Championship match against the Smoking Guns, where he would then join the WWE heel faction or bad guy faction known as Camp Cornette, thereby solidifying his status as one of the top bad guys in the company. A little bit on the dark side, a little bit bad. It's like, I like that guy, it's cool, he tells it like it is, you know. Owen would continue to establish a new rivalry against the heartbreak kid Shawn Michaels as he reminded fans that he beat Michaels back in a match in November of 1995. First of all, I am going to end your career like I should have done the first time. The second one, I'm going to WrestleMania and taking the WWF title. However, in February of 1996, Michaels struck back and scored a win against Hart, putting an end to their rivalry. I love working with Owen, you know, but Vince didn't think Owen was main event material. Uh, you know, Owen was sort of, Owen fell into the same thing that Davey fell into. You have good matches, boom, we get that one shot. We could never get that program, that long program with the main event guy. Owen's villainous streak continued for another year after this until he reunited with his brother Brett to re-establish the Hart Foundation, which would become one of the most hated groups on any US WWE show at the time which was great for business from a WWE standpoint as it kept the fans coming back for more. During the late 90s, the WWE's content became a lot more edgier. And it was during this time that a storyline was proposed to Owen, which would see him have an on-screen affair with a wrestling manager named Debra. However, Owen, who was known amongst his fellow wrestlers as being a very devout family man, rejected the idea. Owen was always business. Yeah, the very smart one of the family could separate one from the other what was important to Owen was his family and all that stuff you know some people will say they uh they live for wrestling and uh i think they have it backwards i think owen was had his priorities in the right order because he lived for his family owen would then return as the blue blazer character which many are of the opinion that this was a type of punishment for him not going along with the proposed storyline of the affair. And unfortunately, this would be his last gimmick in the WWE. Roughly 75 minutes into a WWE pay-per-view event at the Kemper Arena in Kansas City, Missouri, Owen Hart prepared to descend from the arena rafters as his match was introduced. 
Instead, witnesses would see Hart fall at a height of 78 feet into the ring. Tell me what happened with uh, with Owen Hart. Did you see it all? Yeah, what I've happened? Seen it. it looked like he really got hurt, to be honest with you. A broken neck or something. He fell. I didn't see where he fell, but I know he fell and hit the corner post. Yeah. It looked like he got pretty messed up to me. Did you see what happened? Did you see what happened to Owen Hart? Did you tell what happened? Yeah, it looked like he fell from the top baskets. And, you know, it kind of landed over the back of his neck. So I guess that's basically what happened. Did, uh, did it look like he got hurt real bad when you saw yeah, him? Yeah, it really did. It looked like he had a pretty bad fall. Okay. See him up in the rafters? Yeah, it was like a rope from or something. Did it look like he got hurt really bad when he hit? Oh, yeah, yeah you can tell. My aunt, she said that she thought he was dead when he hit. Um, he was coming down on a cord, and all of a sudden it snapped. And he dropped, and they were pumping his chest. As Hart's 229-pound body fell to the ring, he narrowly brushed past referee Jimmy Corderas, who was left with a bump on his head and would seek future counseling, which the company assisted him with. I was holding the, the top rope with my left hand and I was kicking stuff out of the ring and heading towards that same corner. I was walking towards that corner. And there was a promo playing on the screen uh, of Kevin Kelly interviewing Owen the blue, as a Blue Blazer. So I was kind of half watching that and half kicking the stuff out. And I heard some screaming. I didn't, again, not knowing anything. And I felt something brush against the side of my head and my shoulder. And that, it, instantaneously, that top rope that I was holding snapped out of my hand and snapped back. And I didn't know what it was. So I, my, my instant reaction was to duck. Because I'm, like, I didn't know what was going on, so I kind of look around and I saw that the rope was still there. I, I thought it didn't break, so I don't know what's going on. And I, and I, wow. And I turn and I look in the corner and there's Owen laying there, face up. Medics rushed to the ring to perform CPR on Hart before he was transferred to the Truman Medical Center in Kansas City, Missouri, where he was pronounced dead. You know, normally we'd fly you down here to tell you this kind of news, but you know, your husband has died. I just melted into that chair. He hated that blue blazer costume. He hated the, he never liked the, that role or that character. The last few seconds that he had must have been just such an awful feeling. I think that I think this is the worst possible way for him to go. Earlier in the day, several tests were run, including rigger Bobby Talbert and assistant Matt Allman using a 250 pound sandbag as a stand-in for Hart. Allman then proceeded to descend once, followed by Owen Hart, who also did one rehearsal prior to the pay-per-view event starting. A subsequent investigation determined that a subtle movement could have triggered his quick-release harness to unhitch. However, from a risk standpoint, there was more to it than that. As a man by the name of Joe Branham, who had previously been outsourced for such stunts in the past, including with Hart the previous year, warned the company of the dangers associated with their request for a quicker release. And the fact that the World Wrestling Federation let the show continue, you know, one hour after announcing that Owen Hart had died, uh, it, it really is a, a black eye on the entire industry that already has enough of one as it is. I think of Vince McMahon had dropped Shane McMahon from the ceiling uh, and he splatted on the mat. I don't think he would have scraped him off the mat and sent the next match out. I actually know firsthand from the wrestlers involved that they wheeled my dead brother past, right past all the wrestlers and actually pushed wrestlers out the door and said, go, 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 you're on. It was also reported that the WWE did not make use of Joe Branham anymore because he was allegedly too costly. There have also been other reports which stated that this had nothing to do with cost and that Joe Branham, who had over 30 years of experience at the time of Owen Hart's death and was also contracted by companies such as Disney and MGM, simply stated that he refused to rig another human being to a quick release for this type of stunt. Why was he not on a full A line or some other backup line, it's, which is normally used for anybody that's using the rigging? There would be a safeguard that someone would control. I'm not an expert on rigging. I guess you are. Well, it would appear that there were no precautionary measures taken. Why not? Uh, first of all, I, I resent your tone. Um, uh, I so, resent so, sarcasm. Again, no, no, I, I resent your tone, lady, okay? Why, why you know, this was a tragic accident. 
Essentially, the WWE wanted to eliminate the lag time from Owen Hart unhooking himself. And the solution to their problem was with this quick release snap shackle. According to Martha Hart, not only did Owen have a fear of heights, but he also apparently expressed concerns with regards to this new method of how he was going to be lowered into the ring. You know, I did voice that I, I wasn't comfortable with it and that I thought it wasn't safe. And I did say that um, there should definitely be safety nets and whatnot. And he, uh, he was also concerned about it and rightly so. While no criminal charges were laid, a wrongful death lawsuit was launched weeks later by Martha Hart with in-law Stu, Helen, as well as Bret Hart attached as plaintiffs against the World Wrestling Federation, Vince McMahon, and several others they deemed responsible for Owen's death. At 10.01 a.m. this morning, with my full authority, my legal counsel filed a wrongful death lawsuit in the Circuit Court of Jackson County, Kansas City, Missouri, against WWF, Vince McMahon, Titan Sports, and all others I believe are responsible for my husband's death. The WWE responded by countersuing Martha in an attempt to move the suit to the state of Connecticut, which is the state which does not award punitive damages. This is a stunt that's performed on a routine basis uh, in any number of, of venues. Uh, Owen was simply to descend into the ring in superhero-like fashion. By November of 2000, a settlement had been reached for a reported $18 million. However, the whole incident seemed to tear the Hart family apart, which sadly played out in the public eye. You know, it's funny, Martha got the $18 million settlement and has now gone to school in Oxford, England or somewhere and they've got a, a degree in psychology, but she should analyze her own self and ask herself why she's so cold-hearted and uh, selfish to want to lock up the, the, all the great memories that my brother Owen has that are locked up in, a, in uh, warehouses and uh, studios in WWE in Connecticut that, 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 that they're not allowed to use or they're not using because they're trying to respect her wishes, which is absolutely in Owen's memory, Martha Hart launched the Owen Hart Foundation and she has become a celebrated figure for the Foundation's efforts and for helping many individuals through its contributions. Until recently, Martha and her family had removed themselves from professional wrestling, leading most to wrongly assume that Martha held a vendetta against the industry. Rather, it was Martha who simply took the stance that she would not engage in any business with the company who she felt was culpable for the negligence associated with Owen Hart's death. And in 2018, Martha proudly displayed a plaque to celebrate Owen's induction into the George Tragos Lou Thez Professional Wrestling Hall of Fame, which was a precursor to Martha working alongside AEW and Tony Khan to celebrate Hart with the launch of the Owen Hart Foundation Tournament. And she has also refused a request from the WWE to have Owen Hart inducted into the Hall of Fame. He's not in the Hall of Fame because his wife does not want him celebrated and glorified by the same company that took him away from her. Owen Hart had died just a couple of years before he was planning to retire and to this day he's still regarded by many in the industry as one of their all-time best wrestlers and performers and it's sad that he couldn't live out what many regarded as his true passion to be a full-time husband to his wife and father to his kids. I just uh, you never never thought, I never dreamed something like that could happen in wrestling. I also recently did a segment with regards to the Chris Benoit murders and if you haven't seen it I'll drop the link in the description below. But with regards to the tragic death of Owen Hart, let me know what you guys think in the comments and as always thanks for watching.